Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to this week's classic episode of Angler West. This week we're traveling to Hot Springs, Arkansas to meet up with the late, great Cotton Cordell, one of the most iconic figures in the modern history of sport fishing. And then we're going to head down to the coast of Louisiana with his son Mike Cordell and some great friends from Louisiana to do some nighttime speckled trout and big Louisiana redfish fishing. One of the most fun fisheries you could possibly ever run across. Now probably the fondest memories I have in producing the show go back to the couple of days I spent with Cotton Cordell in producing this episode. Now Cotton started in the fishing industry very young but became well known eventually for particular lures that he invented. The flat-sided lure, which the Cordell Spot you may know it as, or a little later on, the Rattle Trap was another brand. And now you got the Spro Aruku Shad, which is probably the most advanced version of, of this type of lure now, the flat-sided, you know, real loud, rattling type of, of crankbait. That all goes back to cotton, plus lots of other lures. Now, the, the lures that he made originally were out of wood. You know, he used a knife and to, to whittle out a piece of wood, and he's going to show you a little bit in this episode how, how he does that and talk about the types of wood that he used. But these days, handmade carved wooden lures are they're, they're very rare. You're not going to walk into your typical tackle shop and find those types of lures anywhere. You know, there's a few guys that make them in their garage, and that's that's great but it, it's not something that's available to most people now because the buyers in tackle shops and the big tackle shops they they just they just not gonna they, they probably don't even know they exist so let me show you something that I am bringing in to the shop now and the only reason that I know these exist is because I went to Finland and visited the factory. I did a couple shows there. If you've been watching the show for a while, you saw an ice fishing show I did with the people at uh, Finlandia Ustanoi, which is Niels Master and a few other brands. And I was blown away by the fact that they actually make all their lures, and not just a few. This isn't a garage company. They produce millions and millions and millions of euros worth of lures that ship all around the world every year it's a it's a very sizable company but that just because of the way the fishing industry works in the united states you don't have access to these and i you know if you want to come in the shop i'll explain it to you but we don't have time right now but i'm bringing them in you know because i'm not really controlled by the powers that be in the fishing industry I, I know about these lures, I know where to get them, and I'm getting them. So these are handmade wooden lures. This is a blank that I brought back from Finland last time I was there. It matches up with this particular lure right here. These are Invincibles, the Niels Master Invincibles, which are just fantastic lures. They're very popular in Europe, all around the world. So, and this particular one right here, I don't know if you can, I'm sure you can't see it, but there's a lot of teeth marks on there. The Tiger Muskie and Merwin love this particular lure right here. In fact, of all the thousands of lures I've got here, if, if there's a fire and I can only grab one, this, this particular lure right here <laughs> would be the one. I've just had really good luck with it. So these are coming next week. They are on the plane right now as we speak. So first week of January 2021, these are going to be stocked in the store here. They'll be available online soon. And I'm pretty sure, other than on eBay for crazy amounts of money, uh, you, you're just not going to find these anywhere in the United States. So if you're into real high-end, real fishy lures, lures to catch fish, not designed so much to catch fishermen, then you might want to take a look at these Niels Master lures. So what's the big deal with wood? Why not just go to plastic like everyone else? Well, I think the, the original owners, Hanu and his brother Kalabi, who started the company back in 1963, they knew that you cannot match the fish catching ability of wood with plastic. You just can't do it. The wobble isn't going to be the same. And in, in Europe, they call these wobblers. Uh, the wobble and the buoyancy and just how the lure communicates with the fish. So they were trying to produce the best lure possible and the best material for that is wood. And so that's why. So for this particular style of lure, wood is definitely the way to go. Now, let's go to Hot Springs, Arkansas and spend a little time with Cotton Cordell. 
Hot Springs, Arkansas is well known for many reasons. Back in the day, it was neutral territory and a place to party and gamble for the likes of Al Capone, and later, the childhood home of Bill Clinton. But if you're a fisherman, Hot Springs is most famous as the home of Cotton Cordell, perhaps America's most legendary and influential lure designer. You might recognize the original hot spot. I built a lot of fish lures over the years, and, and until I built that one right there, I never could get anything going. But uh, I was, back then there was, a, there was two or three baits. There, one was a swimming minnow, and uh, one was a pico perch. But it, let me lay that down so I can use both hands here. But I was sitting on the deer stand one day and I got a piece of, pulled a piece of bark off a tree and I was going to whittle out one of those, one of those, peak, one of those pico perch or, or uh, uh, swimming minnow. And uh, I started whittling on this side here. And the stick was about that, the bark was about that long. And, uh, when I got it down there and got it out so pretty, I just hated to cut all this off, so I just tapered it down in place, place of cutting it off like that. That's a pico perch would look just like that. And uh, whenever I started fishing that thing, it didn't catch fish so good. Whenever I sold some of them, it just went across the country like a prayer fire. I mean. Uh, it just, it went by itself. It, it didn't have any promotion behind it. It just, only thing it had was word to mouth and fish catching ability. This is the best wood that you can buy for, for a fishing lure. It's Jayathon, Jayathon. It's, it's made down, and it comes off of some of those islands down in the Caribbean. And uh, it's real expensive, but it, it doesn't have any grains in there. You know, when you're, when you're whittling on a board, you know, if your knife gets hung in a grain, it'll, it'll chip that grain part off. But this one, it won't chip off. It's, it's solid, it's more solid. And it's, and it's easier, to, easier to whittle on, let me show you. See how straight that cut? See that that thing didn't even it didn't even try to jump off of that. Cotton's office looks like any other, except that it's really a fishing museum, documenting his lifetime as a pioneer of American sport fishing. And behind every memento, picture, and plaque is a story. I used to worked three or four shows in Houston at the Astrodome down there, and right outside of Houston somewhere, these astronauts were training to go to the moon. And there's a lot of stuff in the paper about it. And I had a friend down there who was a sports writer, and I was fixing to go down there and do a, a tackle show one time. I always carried fishing rods down there and sold fishing rods out of a booth, and, and uh, all had lots of fun, a lot of a lot of old fishermen, you ain't no more fun talking to a bunch of old fishermen. And but I said, I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to send y'all a dozen lures, a brand new dozen pack of lures. And I want you to put it on that, on that rocket and take it to the moon with you, but don't bring it back, leave it there. And they said, leave it there? And I said, yeah, please, just leave it there. I'll send you something to fish with, just, just, leave, just leave this dozen up there. And, uh, Whenever they got back, one of them called me the first first day. First day they got back, he said, I didn't couldn't do it. He said, We just couldn't we just couldn't leave it up there. So we got to talking about it and everything and said, I'm I'm glad we didn't. Said uh, it would have been a nice deal, but said we just couldn't do it. But he said, by the way, he said, Why did you want us to leave them up there? And I said, Well, if you, whatever you got back, if you'd have left them up there, I was going to put an ad in Sports and Field, a full page ad in all the major magazines, and say, if you ever decide to go to the moon fishing, don't bother to take lures. Cotton Cordell's already put some up there. Cotton began his Hall of Fame career on the banks of Lake Catherine, near Hot Springs, 
where his father provided boats for the World War II era fishermen who came for the red hot fight. This is the beginning of Lake Catherine. This is the top of the lake. The dam behind me separates Lake Hamilton and Lake Catherine. There's three lakes involved here. The one above the other lake there is, is a Wash Lake Washtaw, which is the most famous. But it was it's it was the one that was built in, in 1950. It was a it's the newest lake. But I spent most of my life right in right in through here between here and the hundred yard line there. In Arkansas, back in those days, and it started during the war, you couldn't get within a hundred yards of the dam on either side because uh, we was in we was in a war and they was afraid someone would slip in here and blow it up. I was born and raised in a little town over here about 30 miles from here. Uh, the name of the town is Benton, Benton, Arkansas. And my dad worked over there all my life until uh, my senior year in high school, he came over here and bought a boat dock that was here. Now the boat dock consisted of a, of a house, little, little house place, a, a metal shed, and a little front where we had sold tackle and stuff. Down here on these banks, we had we had 16 boats. They were they were made out of wood, and and had and we equipped each one of them with an anchor and with oars. As you can see, the current behind me gets pretty tough, and you could, the anchor the oars come in handy real good. We had 16 boats that, that came with the place when we bought it, and Dad and I we we every year we'd take eight of them out and redo them, and then we would build eight new ones in place of them. So we built our own boat, and uh, we'd rent them for a dollar a day. Now, 16 boats don't sound like much then, but, but back then, that was pretty good money. And on Saturday and Sunday, we would rent them, we'd rent those boats three or four or five times. We, we, we would rent as many as 50 boats a day on the weekends because people would come here and they'd go out there and they'd catch their limit and they'd come in and there'd always be somebody here ready to go again. They'd all come up here and anchor on this 100 yard line just about and my dad would sit up there like an eagle and he'd watch them and if, none of, if, if there was one out there wasn't catching fish, he'd tap me on the shoulder and say, hey boy, go out there and rig them up and show them how to catch fish. And so I'd, I'd paddle out there and I'd retie the rigs and fix it and show it up there and show them how to bounce the cart and make the men a jump, you know. And, and, uh, and show them how to catch fish. And all I had to do is show them once, they'd come back and they'd, they'd never forget it. They'd be back and do it again. Most everyone that left here left with a limit of fish, so. One of the reasons I, I used live shad is because it was right after the war, 1946, 1950. And, and uh, the, the companies that existed then they couldn't during that time they couldn't get material to build lures with and if they did I couldn't afford them so uh, I started working around and turned kind of building them myself and uh, I always tell folks that the reason I started started building fishing lures is because I didn't have money to buy them and I had to go fishing Cotton now spends most of his time designing new lures and helping out his son Michael, who runs Fort Michael's Trading Company, which paints, assembles, and distributes custom lures all over the world. Mickey's going to show you a little bit about how we paint fishing lures. Basically, everybody thinks it's a hard, uh, you know, all done by machine, never touched by a human hand. But all fishing lures are painted basically the same way with a small airbrush and different, many different colors of paints. You just got to find somebody that's got a really good artistic eye and can paint them all the same all the time, every day. And it's completed. If you have any questions, just give Mike a call about his operation. Now up next, we're traveling with Mike and a few friends to the southern Louisiana coast where we're going after big oil rig redfish. Isn't that a pair? Welcome to the Cajun country of southern Louisiana. I'm Justin Wolf. Mike Cordell and a few friends have traveled from Arkansas to a fish camp located south of Huma, which is about an hour and a half drive southwest of New Orleans. In other words, we're in the middle of redfish country. 
We've set out about an hour before sunset for a nighttime redfish and speckled trout expedition. Well, we just drove nine hours from Hot Springs, Arkansas to South Louisiana. We're going down the bayou here to hit Terrebonne Bay and go out and do a little redfish speck fishing and see if we can test out some new lures. To have a crew of local experts on board was a comfort to me as we navigated the various bayous and chased the darkness into Terrebonne Bay. For me, it was a new and exciting adventure. For these guys, it's just another night on the water for world-class speckled trout and redfish catching. see a lot of lights out here in Terrebonne Bay. These are all oil rigs that you can fish around, and they do have some, they do hold some fish. But we've got one particular oil rig out here at the end of one of the barrier islands that draws in a lot more bait and shrimp, and therefore brings in a lot more fish. So you're gonna see a lot of good fishing here after a while. Look at them, Johnny. Look at them in the water. Yeah. See them right there? Oh, yeah. After about an hour and a half run, we pulled up next to a large oil platform. Granny, we got three foot right here and the tide's all the way down. You ready? And it was obvious right away that the lights had attracted the bait fish and shrimp, which of course brings in the specks and reds that we're focused on. Got a trout on. That's a speckled trout, the first one, the caught one on the very first cast. Uh, they're pretty indigenous to these waters and a lot of people fish for them. I had brought my own Targus fly rod and reel just in case, and it didn't take long for Zane, one of our local hosts, to pick it up to try for the first time. Zane's caught countless specks on spinning gear, but I think... Hey, Brandon! Put your on fly rod. Really enjoy the fly rod. Another trout here. Um, one way we like to eat these, we just fillet them off the bone, fillet them off the, the scales, just fry that. That's about how most people do. You can also bake it. A uh, little better fry than anything, but it's good eating right here. It's probably about 13, 14 inches, legal size 12. So, okay, pretty good fish right now. Hey, what, Michael? He's a like Danny, look at him break While the here. locals really wanted to load up on the good eating speckled trout, the crew from Arkansas was definitely more interested in the hard fighting redfish. Redfish up to 36 pounds have been caught off this platform recently, but we'll have to settle for this little one to begin All with. All right. See him croaking? Yeah. <laughs> Jumping at us. He was fussing at us, wasn't he? Oh, he still is. Belly <laughs> Man, that'll make your hand hurt. Actually, the redfish bite started off a little slow, but I never got the feeling that anyone on board was worried about the bite not turning on. <laughs> that flying fish. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. I got a little stop. That's on the Luma shrimp deal. You got it? I got it. Oh, no. Not yet. Come here, Junior. There's one. No There's another one over there, too. You got a fish? I bumped it. This is a nice size red. It's 24 inches. Uh, you can catch about you can catch two over 27, so this is about the nice size fish that you can take it, skin it from the scales on down, leave it on the scales, and cook it on a barbecue pit. Where's he going, Chris? He's trying to go out. I think he's going back to Tampa. <laughs> that one last year turned three times and took off. Can you get him at all? Get him back up again? Oh, he, he's not done. Now watch that line up there. Chris, Chris. Come on, Junior. Don't knock him off there, Brandon. <laughs> Come here, baby. Come on. Get up here. 
That a boy. That's a nice one right here. It's another nice red look. They got another one right there. They just hooked up. It's about 27 inches. Good. And you can only keep one per person of these. But uh, it does look like it's gonna be a good night so far. The way it's looking. It's the darnest thing I've ever seen, and it's always like this. Uh, anywhere from 150 to 200 fish every time we come. And I don't know where they all come from, but they're here. And one night it'll be a lot of redfish and some speckled trout, so other nights it'll, it'll reverse. But we, this is one heck of a fishing hole. Ow, 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 ow. This thing needs to have back drag on it. Brandon, get the, get the, the net. I just picked up this Targus rod and tried fly fishing with it and I caught my first red fish on the fly rod. Try to get them in the boat right quick. We brought some uh, Gary Loomis Glimmer Mena flies to try on these red fish and as you can see they're working very well with a fly rod and a Gary Loomis Glimmer Mena. Oh. oh. Let me see that. Got a net on this side. Uh... That's a pretty one. Don't get that motor in there. He's trying to get the prop. That's pretty right there. That's what we're looking for. You trying to catch the same one I got? It's a good bull right there. Real nice. Oh, look at him run. Come here, Junior. Watch, they still fighting in the back. Chris, you back over here? Get one of them on that fly rod. Get one of them on that fly rod. I see yours. Ooh, ooh. Look at him, he's surfacing right there. Oh, he won't fit in there. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Keep his head up. Oh, yeah, there we go. Woo. That's a now pretty that's fish. A bull. That's a bull. What pound test you got on that one? That's a 20 pound braid. I, uh, was it? I wanted that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't that a pair? Isn't that a pair? Two of me legal. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go back. Gotta go back. There you go. Okay, now this is redfish. Yeah, that's redfish cut up in small batches. And you soak it in. What we do is we put hot sauce, a little mustard, and soak it in beer, and you season fish fry. Okay. So you, you you leave it for what? 20, 30 minutes. 20 or 30 minutes, that's all? Yeah. Okay. I bet that's good. That's going to make some good eating. Cajun style. A Cajun fish fry wouldn't be right without a crab boil to go with it. So we'll just pull in the traps and get the water started. On this trip, I learned that the secret to a really good crab boil is to add cayenne pepper. And then more pepper. And then more pepper on top of that. Crabs sure were tasty, even if they did burn my lips a little bit. But I was really surprised and pleased with how good the redfish tasted. We released most of the fish we had caught the night before, but the few that we did release into the grease sure were great. A friend of mine had recently informed me that the redfish were no good to eat, but I can tell you that the real experts in southern Louisiana disagree.
thanks for watching today's episode. You know, without the support of the sponsors, the show would not be possible. So please thank them when you can. Now get out there and do some great fishing.